I worked in the human services, I still do, and so a lot of my poetry is about um, stories of the people I worked with. And um, I see that two people who were in the poetry class with me, uh, Robert and Pat was here. There you are. Hey, they helped me workshop this poem in uh, the poetry class, so I'm going to read this one. It's called, it's dedicated to the uh, widows of Vietnam and it's called Love of My Life. She melted as his arm laid her head on the pillow with their sighs, and the flame of his desire baited her breath, his body burning over like kindling on embers until she was the fire. And she whispered, love my life once more. Once more before your belly drags the jungle floor at your, and your face splashes down, your pillow a stagnant sump. Once more before the chopping world of war drowns your cry, and I lie long with the ghost of Vietnam. Once more she woke with silver hair and saw his smile in their grandchild's eyes, his love still a pulse. Her, halt, her, her heart held his hand as she heard him say, poor kid, she looks like me, and his magic lit her laughter once more. So this is um, one of the pieces that I wrote during during women's lives into literature, which was a great class. Is this on? Yeah, I think you just flipped off. You may have just flipped it off. Okay, this is one of the pieces that came out of women's lives into literature, which is a great class even for men. We had a man in the class, very brave. Um, anyway, dinner at Flynn's. <coughs> Three shots of bourbon and Breslin's, oh man. He empties his pockets and sits on the can. Damn, he exhales. Flynn's booze is so good. And I'd love me a girl just like Peg if I could. One day I'll make sergeant and find a good wife. Buy a nice bungalow, get me a wife. I'll be on the job, but I won't be alone. And I'll always have sugar to welcome me home. Buckled and combed, zipped up at the fly, Breslin joins Flynn for some coconut pie. Coffee and cream with a shot on the side. Three cute little kids are along for the ride. The youngest in diapers, her cheeks full of pink, toddles off to the potty for fun at the sink. She hums and she flushes three times for good measure. Playing with water gives Janie such pleasure. Now Janie comes back to show off her new toy. She found it while standing to pee like a boy. <laughs> Breslin and Flynn shoot up quick, but real slow. Easy now, easy now. Don't let it blow. Coffee and cream, three children and pie, and a shiny brass bullet in Breslin's green eye. So I, ironically, I'm, I'm a poet and um, I teach a poetry class, but the piece I got in Mosaic is a short, a, a flash fiction piece, so I don't write a whole lot of fiction, uh, but it was fun. So it's called The Onset of Fall. It was just as it always had been, of course. She walked in the door at 5.50 and there he was, frozen in front of the TV where two men chatted about something to do with ERAs. She set her handbag on the foyer table, slipped off her heels, padded into the kitchen. Hello, she called, reaching into the fridge. Mmm. The crack of the pop top, the fizz as she poured the Pepsi into a glass, calmed her. She stepped into the arched doorway of the kitchen and leaned against it, eyeing the horizon out on the patio door beyond. God, not more rain tonight. Uh-huh. His stocking feet were propped up on the coffee table. Did you hear the sump pump kick in at all today? It must have rained three straight hours. Yeah, a couple of times. Mm, good. Her eyes were drawn to the red geraniums in the large clay pot. Nothing moved on the pavement. My flowers love the rain at least. Wouldn't it be nice if we got to sit out and enjoy them for once before it gets cold? 
It wasn't a question, so he didn't answer. Want a grill tomorrow? I could get steaks on my way home. Mm. She wandered to the patio door and put one hand up to the door frame. Getting dark already by six. Fall soon. Again. She mumbled, tracing the, uh, with her eyes the outline of a distant fir tree against the gray sky. Another year. Ah, oh, no, damn, third out, friggin' Adam done. Another whole year. That worthless piece of shit. Seems like it was just summer starting. 15 mil they're paying this guy. Fall already. How many years now? 12, 13, seemed like more. A few crumpled leaves had already fallen under the bricks and gotten wedged among the flowers. By month's end, she'd need to uproot the dying stalks and drag the pot back to its winter post next to the house. Unbelievable, there goes their shot at the series. Football now. Oh, would you look at that idiot drop that ball? I could have dropped that ball, Christ. And basketball again. Serves them right taking that piece of meatloaf. Serves them right. It repeated in her head like an echo, getting quieter as she watched a jet crawl across the sky. A beam of sunlight broke through the clouds, sparking the white metal. She blinked from the flash, and the slender fuselage shone against the back of her eyelids. She held them shut while the white outline disappeared. When she opened them again, the plane was gone. She finished her Pepsi and walked back to the kitchen. What did you take out for dinner? A commercial for Viagra blared. He used to turn down the volume when she came home. Long ago, he'd come to the door, hold her. Before that, how many years? She'd gotten home first. Dinner, she repeated, taking out her earrings, setting them on the counter. Mmm, something frozen, I guess. What's up there? She stood in the middle of the kitchen, eyes unfocused. Nothing. It doesn't matter. What was that? Recapture the spontaneity of your first years together, a deep voice crooned over a swelling orchestra. The words did not register in her brain. She saw four starlings at the top of the neighbor's tree, sitting with their heads cocked upwards as if waiting for something. The yellowing leaves made a stark contrast against the deep black feathers. Large drops of rain began to plink on the window above the sink. I'll order a pizza, she said. But when he didn't answer, she wondered if she had said it out loud. My poem is called Goodbye Mother, and actually it was actually submitted by mistake. I clicked on the wrong one when I submitted it. <laughs> but it made it, so all right. Um, I have wanted to tell you this for many a year, but I have never had the courage to stand up and yell it. The constant criticism and ludicrous lies you told me over the years have finally caught up to you. The bruises you beat into me and the scars you scorched during their drunken rages have long since healed. The bandages placed over my broken trust have unraveled the truth about you and, have, and they have fallen away, exposing every wound. I have tried to forgive you for all of, the heart he all of the heart heaped upon me by all the poison you whispered into my life ever so loudly. I am now free to fall upon my own graces and release the revelations that are pouring in from my past. I fail to forgive you because I feel it better to disperse the desolation you have inflicted towards me. I can't be complete and say I have not learned anything you taught me through all of the enduring pain. I have learned not to destroy another human being with two instruments God gave me for creating. I have learned not to slay the very essence of life by telling lies towards another using the mighty sword of salvation. I have learned not to hide away in a tiny cave, clinging to the antiquated words of a book whose every page is left open for interpretation. So I stand forth now, screaming with the entirety of my voice, atop the callus that has finally ruptured, that surrounded and protected me until this moment. I scream the words I have longed a lifetime to utter, just three simple words to finish it all. Goodbye, Mother. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this was kind of born out of the, the women's lives into literature class by Dr. Cook. Um, and uh, I, I dedicate this to all the women writers who have preceded us. Many of them are not around any, any longer. 
and how glad I am to be living in the world today. So we've come a long way. Um, it's called The Ordeal of Miss Emily. Old gentle soul, devoted mother of many, sweet love goddess, wise beyond her years, why do they send you away? Cruel judge, forceful husband, son of a, I heard my mother say, love, honor, cherish no more, betray, discard, cast away into the abyss. Now workers in white with charts and pills, kind, genial woman, people judge her, but what trespass caused her to be sent away? I imagine the snake pit, people grabbing, yelling, vacant faces, scary sounds, distress moaning, keeping her awake. She doesn't belong there. Dear God, I pray, protect your faithful daughter. Don't abandon her. Give her peaceful, caring guidance. Protect her from herself. Return her safely to the arms of her children. Weeks later, I watch from our kitchen window as she returns, sweetly hugging her children. She smiles as she puts her ordeal behind her. Life is back to normal, but the memory remains. I hope that everyone can hear me. I, I recognize some faces from when I uh, taught my class at Writers Week, and I want to say a special shout out to you guys. Welcome back. I think this is the first time, is this the first time where we've ever had sort of a panel discussion like this with alumni from the program meeting with students and faculty like yes. this? So this is great, and I think we're all so happy, all of us who uh, will reintroduce the panel to you are so happy to be here tonight because we've all been published in Mosaic. In fact, Mosaic was the first place any of my work was ever published, and I graduated from the program officially in 2009, but I think I stopped taking classes in 2008. And my first piece was called um, Feline Fantasy, and it was about being a cougar. Before that was really old news. <laughs> okay, now it's really old news. Um, but anyway, I think the point, I think if we can get the most out of this tonight, um, this is a dialogue because we're in this great position where some of us are in the program, some of us have completed it, some of us are, are faculty, and we can share these experiences really about how to get the most out of the program if you're currently in it. And then where do we go from here once we have our degrees? And how can we use this, this wonderful program that we've had the privilege, really, of going through um, in our professional lives? So we're going to talk a little bit with these panelists and learn about our experiences. But then we're really going to open it up for um, questions and discussion. So um, with that, let's kick it off. We still have one more panelist coming, but <laughs> he's, he's gone right now. He'll be right back. That's Roja. But anyway, Lisa, would you just introduce yourself and Tell us when you finished your program okay. and what you're doing now, really quickly. Um, for those of you that were here earlier, my name again is Lisa Zimbler. I just completed the program at the end of the summer, and I am currently uh, working for Make It Better magazine as a freelance writer. Hi, I'm Jim Shapanyak. I graduated the program in 2005, and um, the year after I graduated the program, I started my current job which is Community Relations Director for Niles Township High School District 219. So that's 5,000 kids in two high schools, Niles West and Niles North, in Skokie, Morton Grove, Lincolnwood, and uh, Niles just north of the city. Hello, I'm Kay Severinsen. I got my master's here in 2007, I think. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> took me a while. <laughs> um, and uh, after that, I uh, took a job as a web editor at the Sun-Times. And I was there for close to six years. I had a lot of different jobs and wore a lot of different hats and had a lot of different bosses as the Sun-Times went through its many travails, which just keep keep on coming. <laughs> um, so it's, it was really interesting. I actually did like my job a lot. It was just kind of a... A stressful place. Um, I then had a stint at an ad agency and I'm about to start a job as a web content manager for an association in Chicago. And um, Great. I think that's enough, right? Okay. Will you introduce yourself, Roja, and just talk about when you're finishing the program and uh, what your current job is now? Uh, I'm Roja Wilkerson. I should be finishing the program next quarter. Uh, my current job, I'm an editorial assistant with Ebony Magazine. Great. All right. 
Can you hear, can everyone hear me okay? So I don't have to yeah. pass the microphone back and forth. Great, I think it would be interesting just to kick it off and talk a little bit about why you took this program, Masters in Written Communication, and what is the thing that you liked the most or found the most useful about it? Can you just start, Rosha, and then just pass that microphone back? Okay. Um, I decided to take the program because it seemed more diverse, I guess, than other writing programs. They offer classes from uh, journalism, editing, screenwriting, uh, and all types of different writing courses that could be helpful. So instead of just focusing on one um, major topic like editing, it offered me a chance to do multiple things. Okay, great. Okay. So the question is what we liked about the program? Yes, okay. and, and why you took this particular program. Oh, okay. Uh, well, actually, the reason I actually started taking this program was I was teaching high school English, and I needed a master's degree, because then you get to go up on the pay scale. And <laughs> <laughs> so um, this was very convenient for me. You ha uh, and National Lewis has a location that in, in Lyle and so forth. But the advantage was that once I got into the program, um, the classes are small and get a lot of personal tension. And I got to do my thesis with Dr. Cook, and she was amazing in helping me find my fiction writing voice. I'd written a lot of newspaper and nonfiction type writing, but um, fiction is kind of was kind of new to me, and I didn't have the same con level of confidence and stuff. So it was really um, it was a kind of a <clears throat> you know, it was a wonderful experience. So I did it great. So I was, um, I, I actually, my first job was as a reporter for Barnier Press, which was not owned by Sun Times at, at that point. Um, but it won't be much longer. It won't be much, <laughs> it won't be much longer. But I was working downtown at Ameritech at the time, and I had a night <coughs> meeting, and I had some time to kill, and I saw a flyer for a program called What Makes Harry Run, which was Joyce Markle, who used to be with this program. She's retired. And it was just a lecture that she gave about why the Harry Potter books were such a phenomenon. And I was just... I loved, I was like the most exciting, amazing thing for her to explain in one hour how this huge phenomenon had come up that was making kids read books who had never read books. And I was so taken by the lecture that I signed up for her class at National Lewis, um, which was young adult literature, and I enjoyed that so much um, that I signed up for the program. So. As I mentioned before, I was an event planner, so I wasn't um, a writer at all, but it was something that um, I have always been doing since high school. And even through college, I worked at the um, college newspaper. So I always said to myself, if I had the time and energy to go back to school, I would uh, go back and try to find uh, get a writing degree in some way. So when I was looking for master's programs, um, I always thought of myself first as a journalist, so I went to Northwestern's program and took a look at that and the time commitment um, with, with the family and, and my real job, it just wasn't going to work. And I, I continued the search and I came upon an ad featuring Margie, <laughs> <laughs> which was um, an NLU's testimonial, testimonial ad campaign at the time. and. Um, that piqued my interest. I went online, took a look at the program, and I was really impressed by how many different types of um, writing styles I could explore, because at that point I didn't know if I was really going to be a journalist or a creative writer, or poet, what I, but this gave me the chance to you know, go on that journey and figure it out. Um, so I think the program's really great for um, people who are working to um, explore. So I started taking this program after enrolling in graduate school at Northwestern. I didn't um, enroll in their journalism program, but I started to get my master's in communication there. And I was so discouraged because I felt like the program there was so academic and so theoretical and so research oriented. And it wasn't, I just felt like it wasn't anything about applying communication skills in real life. And so then I found this program at National Lewis, which again, allow you to explore all the different areas of writing, which I think is so valuable. So it's interesting because we've all came to this program for very different reasons, and I'm sure that's true for all of you. And um, now I'd like to ask the panel, 
what, if, if you haven't answered it already, what you may have is the thing that you feel that you really <clears throat> got out of it, and what advice would you give current students to take advantage of and, and use their time here? Um, I really appreciated the one-on-one -on -one help that the instructors give, uh, because the classes are so small. There's usually maybe six people at the most, so you can go if you have any questions or um, you need any help with anything, your professors are very accessible. And um, I think I just took that, they help you to become a better writer there. They've been in the field for a long time, so um, they can just help with anything that you might need. Yeah, so make sure to establish real close relationships <coughs> with your professors. How about you, Kay? Well, that's what I was going to say too. <laughs> um, because your classes are so small, that just that's just something you don't find very many places, and you have the opportunity to really get to know your professors and uh, get that specialized help that you might need to get over the particular humps, whatever you've got. Um, you had also asked what we might recommend, and I would suggest that in addition to um, making. Uh, friends with or getting to know your professors that you also look for opportunities around Chicago because you're really fortunate that you live in this area with so many opportunities out there and a lot of places um, are actually looking for people who can kind of start at um, an entry-level sort of way because a lot of places are strapped for funds and Students are cheap. Um, but it's a great way to get experience. And if you get to know people, you make contacts. And for the most part, in my experience, you don't tend to get those full-time jobs without having experience, something to show, uh, and what we used to call clips, um, back when you clipped things out of newspapers. <laughs> um, but your writing samples, especially published writing samples, will help you get those first jobs in writing fields. And you can get those uh, writing samples in a, from a professional publication or website or something along those lines by doing internships, by contacting people, by freelancing, um, by getting assistantships and so forth. So I would really stress trying to do that. Yeah, and to pick up on that, I mean, I think that the, the strength of the program for me was, first of all, the fact that uh, uh, learning that they're writing jobs and having success in writing does not just mean I'm a novelist, I wrote a play, a screenplay, or I have a blog, which are all wonderful, fantastic things. But in fact, like in my job, working for the high school district, um, the premium and the importance of being able to explain something like a tax issue or some very nuts and bolts boring thing and, and the importance of making it not boring and, and understandable to the average person. And specifically in the program, um, I was telling Margie when she asked me the question we were talking on the phone, the first thing that popped into my mind was that I learned in this program the power of the concrete example. And the concrete example is that rather than making some general statement, which is the problem with all this academic writing we see all the time, you bring it down to earth with an example. You have a person a place, a thing, a story, and you make it human, and that's your lead. And then people read it and they go, oh, okay, well maybe I need to know more about this. And it was something that in my mind I knew intellectually, but I didn't really practice it. And the program really led me to understand the power of the concrete example. And just to bring it home, when I had the job interview for my current job, um, I was trying to figure out what I could do to um, to show what I would like to do in the job. And I took their annual report which is full of this kind of education ease, the typical stuff we hear. And I just rewrote three paragraphs of the annual report using concrete examples. And I won't say that got me the job, but it, it certainly helped. And that way of thinking, I think, helps me in my job every day. So, um, you know, it sounds, like, it sounds really nerdy or really whatever, but that, I mean, the program brought that back to me. And that was after 20 years of working. And, and, but it brought, like this fresh idea that, it, that I've been using ever since that time, so. And you still may be the only person who has written an exciting annual report. <laughs> <laughs> you must submit that to Mosaic. I totally agree with you, and I think the, the big strength of the program are the professors and the teachers yeah. uh, who have real-world experience. Lou Carlozo is here tonight, I'm good to see, it's good to see you, Lou. And I learned so much from that man. Um, and use 
the skills I learned in both of his journalism classes every single day in my writing. So the things that I learned weren't just textbook stuff. I mean, and he has a great textbook, by the way. Um, and it's something you can actually use. It's not just theory stuff. Um, so I would say the teachers and the guidance and also the strength of your peers and being able to make connections with people that you wouldn't normally have the opportunity to meet um, and share your writing with because we need each other, I think. All right, so I'm gonna tell a little Lou Carlozo story <laughs> because it ties, Lou was not associated with National Lewis when I was here. But my thesis project, because I wanted to write a column, was a blog. Everything I say now sounds so outdated, but then when I was blogging, that was a pretty <laughs> new thing. And um, Dr. Cook said, if you want a column, you need to start a blog. And so I, I, I did, that was my thesis project. Um, I have a friend, Hillary, who is a, has been a long-standing reporter and has worked with Lou over the years. And uh, Lou was part of a project called True Slant, which was a huge collaborative blog that is now part of Forbes. And he was the bureau chief here in Chicago, and he was getting Chicago writers to, to, do, uh, to contribute to this online site. And so Hillary introduced me to Lou. Now, I had not been a reporter like Hillary or Lou, but because I had a blog and because I had been writing and demonstrating that I, was it, I could write, that I was committed to writing, that I had a point of view, I began to work for Lou for Truth Slant. So it's good to see you again, Lou. <laughs> and that would be my piece of advice, is do not wait to be published. Mm -hmm. I don't mean give your work away to others. I mean do not wait to be published. If you have a point of view, if you are writing, do it because that that commitment will not only increase your talent and your abilities as a writer, it will show that you're serious and it will get you other work. So that would be my advice. So let me just ask, I, I feel like other people, you might, how did you get your job at Ebony? Um, I actually <laughs> just walked over there one day. <laughs> <laughs> I have my resume in my hand. Uh, and I ran, happened to run into the HR director and um, gave him my resume. He liked what he saw. And uh, I think about a month went by of us going back and forth, trying to see if I could come in for an interview. Um, and then I guess their old editorial assistant finally left and they had the position open. So I went in and I met with the editor in chief and uh, told her about the program, showed her some of my writing samples. and. Uh, she liked what she saw and hired me on the spot. Uh, that's good. So obviously, Roja, that was just pure luck. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Kay? Can you talk a little bit about how what you've learned in this program has helped you in pr professionally? Um, well, I think that it always helps to have a sense of self-confidence in yourselves. Um, a lot of times as writers, especially if we haven't been published a lot, it's a, there's a tendency to think, oh, other people are better, but I'm just, you know, who am I? Because I haven't had a byline or I haven't been published or whatever. Uh, but one of the things that you can get out of this program, as I did, is a sense of yourself, who you are as a writer. And like Margie was saying, what your sort of your niche is or what are you good at? Especially for some of you who have had other careers in life, maybe you started out doing something else and this is maybe a mid-career change or a mid-direction a change. Um, you might know something that other people need to know about. Um, I met a lady the other day who had been a nurse and she started fiction writing uh, a couple of years ago and now she's just going great guns. But the fact that she's got this background in med medicine and med all things medical could lead her to any number of careers as a writer as well. Um, and I personally have no particular skills. So hey. <laughs> other, than, <laughs> other than the ability that, that I can write, but I mean, I don't have anything particular going on for myself. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, so I could write about teaching. Um, so far, I haven't been able to, to uh, turn that into a, a job writing about teaching yet, but that may yet happen. Who knows? But um, those, I think those are the 
the two things I would say is that try to finding your own voice, finding out who you are as a writer is something you can do here, and developing a sense of confidence in yourself as somebody who is worth reading, who is worth hearing from. Um, those are things that you can get here. Yeah. And I sort of answered the question, but that just reminds me that one of the great powers of being a writer is nobody. You just say you're a writer, and then people think you're a writer. <laughs> so, one of the powers that gives you is you get to ask people questions that they wouldn't normally have to answer, and they're going to answer them because you're telling them that you're a writer. And so, I have to say, as I'm working on this article, or I would like to know more about what you do, and they're not going to ask for your credentials. You can say you're, and that gives you an in that other people don't have. It also, for me, gives me a sense of confidence and a reason to be in the room that I might not otherwise have. And that's a very, very powerful thing. So I said, take advantage of that. When I started the program, I thought I'd be writing for the bridal industry, and, because that's what I know, that's in my wheelhouse. And I quickly discovered that I wasn't even interested in that, and that I, I had a voice much larger than that industry. And, um, and I, like to, I really like to write about people. And, and bring out stories about people that we wouldn't or ordinarily know about. Um, I remember writing a short piece in one of Lou's classes about my experience on one of my internships um, writing obituaries. And um, I came upon a lot of obituaries that I had to edit and I thought, how, how do we not know about this person? This is just awful. And uh, there's a lot of amazing people in our everyday community and, and those are kind of the stories that I've been leaning towards and what's led me to projects like Wings Over Glenview, which has um, shed light on a little known history and men who are just common everyday heroes whose um, voices need to be heard in our community. So don't be afraid to um, go outside of your wheelhouse as a writer. Yeah, I want to echo what everyone has said here, and that is um, get some business cards and, and put your name on them and say writer. You can order them online. <laughs> it took me a long time to actually have the courage to do that and do it because you are writers. Yep. And uh, people love to tell their stories. You may be a fiction writer or a poet, you're telling either your own stories or someone else's, but there's so much power, people want to tell their stories. Yesterday I interviewed two women, one was a photographer. I spoke to her for a half an hour and I felt she, she, I made her day by speaking about the thing that was most important to her, her work, and shining a light on it. It's gonna be published in NS Magazine in January. I also interviewed a woman who has uh, a whole new business that she's developed making kind of PG-13 porn <laughs> for women <laughs> with romantic short movies for women that are not graphic or explicit to try and um, increase their desire. Okay, that was a fun day I had yesterday. <laughs> okay, so I may not have asked everyone all the questions, and you all might have just one more thing that you'd like to share. And so I'm going to ask each of the panelists um, to just share one last thought um, with all of you, and then we're going to open it up for questions and discussions to the group. Okay? Any last thought, Rosha? Um, I guess, like they say, just make connections with uh, your fellow students. Because everybody here is uh, looking into getting into a different field of writing, and some of the people that I work with are brilliant and great editors. They give great advice, so just keeping in touch with your classmates will help you a ton. Great. One of the things that's cool about being a writer, which is what it's going to say on your business card, so <laughs> you are one, um, is that you're always growing and learning and if because to be a writer to, you have to think about people like you've been mentioning and look at them with new eyes like oh that person's not just the guy I see at the grocery store he is a vet who has a story to tell or um, somebody who makes PG-13 porn or something <laughs> and you and you ask ask questions as you were mentioning um, that you wish 
you could ask, but you couldn't do it unless it said writer on your business card. So you're always curious, you're always growing and expanding, and you're always becoming someone new every time you interview someone, every time you write something new, it changes you in just a little tiny bit. I think that's one of the things that's so exciting about being a writer, is you're never stagnant. So I hope you enjoy that experience. Yeah, and, and the whole, I, t I mean, I think that there is, we have such power, and let's use it. I mean, let's use it to make the world a better place. That sounds so ridiculous, but when you, when you look at what's on the web and you see the crap with the celebrity gossip and the crap with the clickbait, I mean, think of what we can do. And just these, ideas, there's just these examples. I mean, everybody has a story. This is God's wondrous creation. There's so much good out there. So write about it. Ask people about it. And like Margie said, even the power of interviewing someone just so they can tell their story. I mean, that's a great gift that we have, so let's use it. And my final thought is, while you're in the program, just enjoy the process. Don't dial it in, you know. Take advantage of every class, every situation, every person that you're, you come in contact with, every opportunity for an internship. If you see, see something out there and you wanna do it, go to Dr. Cook, she made my Make It Better um, uh, internship happen and that had never been done in our program before and it was kind of my idea <laughs> um, so just go for it and enjoy I, I took my time with the program I wasn't in a big rush to graduate to be honest um, I just I think it's different the second time you go to college the first time on mom and dad's um, bill <laughs> you're just sort of um, getting through but the second time when you make the decision to go back to school um, Make it count. Make it mean something. And I guess my last words would be something that I think either Jim or Kay told me when we talked on the phone prior to this, and that is that <clears throat> the whole writing industry is changing, um, but what is, doesn't change is that people need good thinkers. And writing is just clear thinking, and that is that will always be needed. Um, so go forth and use your great communication skills no matter what you're doing. So now I guess I'd like to open it up for questions or discussion. You can talk to Roja, you can talk to Kay, Jim, Lisa, or me, Margie, or any of us. Anybody have any thoughts or, or things or questions? Oh, I know you do. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. I'll try. Stretch. I'll try to get the mic to you. But maybe stand up. Yeah. Tell us your name. It's my name is Berlin. Um, like I was saying, I think I have a silly question, but um, is producing the same as publishing? Because you know I write scripts, and once they get produced, it's um, published. Is that the same thing? Yeah, I don't, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick, is that true? Let me answer that because um, with plays, usually the process starts uh, before they're published. Publishing sometimes is the last thing that happens with a play. So with plays, what you need to do is go through many drafts, um, have little readings just amongst your friends so you can actually hear what you've done, and then maybe move on to uh, trying to get a staged reading, which, for example, Jay did a play for her thesis project. And now, uh, because I knew about it, and I happened to uh, direct a group called the Chicago Writers Block, and we're a playwright development group. And uh, we got a grant from the Dramatist Guild to do a few student plays. So we're going to have a, a few plays uh, with stage readings, thanks to the Dramatist Guild, from NLU and Jay's play is one of them, um, Bernadette Jones and Frank Friedlander. Uh, the, those three people are going to have their plays. 
So we're going to have a staged reading, which will be part of our Writers Block festivals coming up in the spring, and I'll let you all know about it. But that's just a step along the way. Um, hopefully, after you have maybe a couple of staged readings, and you keep developing your play and polishing it and honing it, um, at that point, maybe, and you have to be proactive with this and send your plays out to theaters, maybe you will get a production of a play. Most plays that get published are published after they've had a production. Um, and if you go to a big play publisher like Samuel French, they only publish plays that uh, have had New York productions, you know, but there are other play publishers, and I've had some plays published by Dramatic Publishing, and Dramatic Publishing is based in Woodstock, Illinois. So um, there are other publishers, if, if playwriting is, is your interest, I would encourage you to work on your play, have several staged readings of it, and then start sending it out for productions. And the end of that line may be getting the play published. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts to share? Come on. Yes, Lou. And as someone who makes his living as a writer, Lou, come up here. Okay, sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um As someone who makes his living as a writer, and I've heard this from like people in my class uh, as recently as this semester, it's like, I would just die to have something published. I mean, isn't it great? And I, I tell them, well, you know, I get have as many as 10 pieces a week published, and when you've got to grind at that level just to make sure the rent is paid, Folks, it ain't easy, right? <laughs> I would do anything to have a full-time job. I haven't had one since 2010, and every time I hear a report in the news saying unemployment is at an all-time low, yeah. I say, you know, unemployment for journalists and writers is definitely at the 20% plus range. And I've, I've challenged a lot of experts to refute that figure, and I've yet to meet one that has been able to. I'm not here to, in any way, doomsay or naysay. It's just to make two points, and, and Lisa heard this a lot in my class, um, is be very clear about what you want. Right? You set a target in front of you and you keep your eyes on that prize. Right? And then if you think that the only way you're going to be happy is to make a living as a writer, I can introduce you to a lot of people who make their livings as writers and they're not necessarily happy. A goal, the one thing, is always attainable. And I think the other thing, too, to realize is you don't have to make a living as a writer to be a writer. We're back in the age now where, where the poetry model really works, right? You know, Wallace Stevens, T.S. Eliot, and Wayne Carlos Williams were three of the greatest poets of the 20th century, and they all had day gigs. You know, Wallace Stevens sold insurance, no lie. <laughs> Wayne Carlos Williams was a doctor, T.S. Eliot was a bank clerk. Right, so if you can get your own blog going, your day job allows you to be your own patron. And I absolutely agree with what Margie and the other people here are saying. Don't wait, start now. You're a writer. There's no ceremony that makes you a writer. You're a writer the instant that you say you are. And that's why I love this program. I love teaching in it because it reinforces the spirit of that, um, that directive or that you, know, you, you appoint yourself a writer and then just keep going for it. Thanks, Lou. Uh, I, I wanted to ask everybody to tell me quickly, let's see, you've already told, shared with us, but what your, the rest of your um, thesis projects were, because I find everyone's thesis project to be so interesting, and sometimes when you're in the program, you don't know what everyone else is doing. So what was your thesis? I'm still working on my thesis. It is a modern day adaptation of Aesop's Fables. Cool. Uh, I, I just have to weigh in. Okay. <laughs> Early reviews. Um, I often find that people in the program turn out some wonderful piece of work, and they don't have any sense of how good it is and, and how 
commercial even that it can be. And it happened that um, in one of the classes, Roja were, wrote this piece. Um, it was it was just the the assignment. Those of you who have all of you in the program have to take advanced expository writing. Sounds really dull and dry, but it isn't. And one of the assignments that you have is to connect a myth or fable or fairy tale um, or biblical tale with uh, with a nonfiction piece of writing. And so Roja did a piece using oh, an Aesop's fable, actually one that I wasn't familiar with, but it had to do with somebody envying going to Las Vegas and winning actually a lot of money, but then noticing that a guy across the table from him won just a little bit more money. And so he started, he was going to leave the gambling table because he had $15,000 and that was great. But then there was that other guy and maybe he could win a little bit more. So he kept gambling and you know, putting down his money, and of course, he left with nothing, okay? Well, there's an Aesop's fable about a dog who um, sees another dog that actually he looks in, the, in a pond, kind of like the Narcissus story, but he, he, he has a bone, a nice meaty bone in his mouth, and then I think he looks in the pond and he sees there's a dog with a bigger bone. <laughs> and he, so he drops the bone, and of course he loses the bone. Well, Roja wrote this uh, fable-based story about gambling. And I said, you know, this is a wonderful idea. Why not take a group of Aesop's fables that, um, that can have some kind of modern connection and because a lot of people, although maybe as kids we were read the fables, but hey, that was a while ago, for me, a long <laughs> while ago. Um, and uh, people would enjoy that, you know, because they're still good. Those Aesop's fables are still good. And it's, they're especially effective and funny when they're applied to modern life. And that's what Roja is doing as his thesis. And, I feel completely confident that he is going to have a book published, which is Roja's Fables. And <laughs> there you are. I don't know if I can compete with that, but um, <laughs> I was, uh, I had been a journalist, so I'd written nonfiction before, so that was my bread and butter back when you could get make a living doing that. Um, but I had always wanted to try fiction, and um, Dr. Cook suggested that I use a short story that I had started in the fiction writing class, I think. It was just a short story, and um, I, they, people had kind of encouraged me to make it a little bit longer, so I had started writing, and it, it was starting to turn into something more, and so she said, why don't you just, you know, make, because I was thinking about making it a book, and she said, you can do that. And I'm like, wow. That's amazing. I can really do that. So I did. And she gave me lots of really good advice. My, my main character was a girl I had actually met. She, she really exists. That um, when she was six years old, she was in a horse riding accident. And she had terrible uh, traumatic brain injury. And she had um, a lot of things that she couldn't do. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk very well. Um, she couldn't live a normal teenager life. And when we saw her the next time, she was 16. Um, and it really made me wonder, what is it like to be a teenager with all the things that teenagers go through? First crushes, um, trying to figure out who you're going to be when you grow up, when you've got that kind of a disability. And so um, in my beginnings of my novel, I had her having a crush on a guy in her class. And um, in chapter three, I killed the guy. And, <laughs> and Dr. Cook said, don't kill off the love interest. <laughs> like, Teenagers need to have hope. And so I, she was absolutely right. So she helped me um, redirect the, the course of the novel, and I actually did finish it. And I've actually done a lot of rewriting since then. Um, and I'm trying again now after letting it sit for about five years. I'm trying to sell it now. So anyway, there you go. 
So when I was wrapping up the program, I knew that my job at Ameritech was coming to an end because the SBC bought Ameritech and they were going out of business. So I had advance notice that I'd be out of a job. And I was trying to figure out what's, I wanted to do something productive that I couldn't otherwise maybe do on my own. And so I took advantage of the fact that I was in the written communications program and was looking at the National Lewis catalog and saw that there was theoretically an internship teaching English composition at the College of DuPage, but it had not actually ever been activated. So I went to Dr. Cook and Joyce Markle at the time and said, I want to do that. And they said, well, that's not the written communications program and you need a sponsor. And this is where I would like to thank Professor Milks because she stepped up and helped me get it done. And I was the first person in the written communications program to have that to have that internship at COD, and my thesis was writing a critique of what it was like to be in the internship at COD without really any formal mentoring. And after that time, um, I know that that was, you know, made a regular part of the course and, and instituted. And uh, again, I think this is where I give such credit to the professors in the program because that you know the the bureaucratic answer from National Lewis was well, you know, we don't know how to make that happen. And they just made it happen, and it, it was fantastic, and it gave me a really great experience, um, and it was something I was also able to use directly again when I was uh, interviewing with this job for the high school. So it was a, a, a real kudos to, to the professors in the program, because if you go to them and ask for help, I mean, they can just make it work, so. Um, yeah, I just yeah. want to add to that, that we now have, because of, you know, sometimes these things happen really from you all, finding a need for something and then we usually follow up um, as Jim said now we have internships at College of DuPage at College of Lake County and at, here at NLU uh, and I'm also open to trying to develop internships at other at other places so if you have an idea either related to a particular college that we may not have an internship at now or if you just have an idea for a program for for a course that interests you I mean I can't promise to make it happen instantly but eventually uh, some of our, our best courses have developed because somebody asked, couldn't we have a course in oral history? And, there, and, then, it, and then it happens. So. Okay. Well, I guess you can see from just the five of us that, that how we've done our degrees, our programs, our interests were so different. I know that's true for all of you. I think I would just say that make this program what you want and, and you'll have the support here. So, um, Thank you. We're going to hang out for a little bit, and we'll talk more. And Just before uh, we uh, end this part of the program, the main event is we have the new mosaics, and I, w I will be here. Uh, we are the the uh, retail price <laughs> is twenty four ninety five, but uh, you all will be able to. Anybody here tonight will be able to buy a copy of Mosaic for $15, and those of you who have contributed will get, will get your free copy, and then you can buy additional copies. So uh, that will be going on uh, just in about two minutes. There's also some quite a bit of cake and other snacks in the back, and Sue O'Brien has... That be thinking about too many, because we think about too many. We've got a flyer in there for the submission, so we'll have a big Oh, okay. Um, your mosaic will have a green flyer, and the green flyer will tell you how to submit. And for those of you who came in late, there will be a scholarship um, to Paris Cafe, uh, which will include at least part and maybe the entire expense of getting back and forth to Paris and staying there and going to the Paris Cafe, which is a week-long program, end of May and in June. Uh, if you submit a piece for Mosaic 2015, you will be eligible to apply for the Paris Cafe Scholarship. Uh, so it's all very exciting. And um, 
So we're going to be up here selling mosaics, and I just want to give one more thank you to Sue O'Brien for the terrific job she has done. How, how many mosaics? At least five. Yes, yeah, I started with the original one with Jim. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. The very first one I was, you know, I worked in as the, the, an editor, but... Right, so she worked on it as an editor, but you know, as a student editor, and then as That's how the. We kind of got the class too, because it just got to be a lot of work. And and, and just this one last note: mosaic started because students asked for it. We didn't have mosaic when I first started teaching in the program, but students asked that there could be something like this, and I said, if you can put the time in to put the first issue of mosaic together. Um, I think Gail Cohn was around at the time Gail and Cohen. she helped us with the editing. And that's why it became a tradition and now it's happening. So if you get a great idea about something, come to me and we will try to make it happen. Anyway, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Step right up and get your mosaic. <laughs> and thank you panel, Margie and our panel.